I'm Stephanie McCurdy. I'm the program and volunteer coordinator here at the Cope Environmental Center. Uh, I've been here for a year now, but this is not my first time at the Cope Environmental Center. I started my career here way back in 1996 when I taught the first year of summer classes. And in 1996, Jim and Helen Cope still lived here on site. So being able to see Jim and Helen Cope on a daily basis and learn from them and their um, philosophies about sustainability was um, something that really shaped who I am as an environmental educator. I graduated from Purdue University with a degree in forestry and wildlife science, and I have taught environmental education for 20 years. So here at the Cope Environmental Center, we focus on sustainability. We promote the wise use of the Earth's resources through education, demonstration, and research. We offer family programs, school programs, um, the beautiful tour of the building that we have here that talks about sustainability and we just do a lot of activities for the community. We want this to be a place that the community comes out and hangs out with us and enjoys and appreciates nature and everything that we have to offer. So today we're going to learn about maple syrup. We're gonna go on a hike and see how maple syrup was made by the Native Americans, the pioneers, and how we make it today. Uh, we're gonna to spend some time in the sugar shack and see maple syrup as it comes right off of the evaporator. So it should be a good opportunity for you to learn a lot of information. Well, welcome all of you to the Cope Environmental Center. Uh, you guys are going to go on a little hike with me today for maple syrup. Tell me all about maple syrup. So, my name is Stephanie. I'm the program and volunteer coordinator here at the Cope Environmental Center. Um, this is not my first maple syrup hike. <laughs> I love this time of year. And it's for two reasons, because who doesn't love maple syrup, right? Do y'all enjoy your pancakes? And yeah. Yes. And also because it means spring is coming. And, um, you know, just a personal story, I was determined when I graduated from college 20 years ago to move south because I hate snow, I hate cold, and I hate winter. And then I um, met a boy and stayed. So every year about February 1st, I start to have this, like, meltdown about it being cold and gross and awful, and then maple syrup happens, and that makes me happy because that means that spring is coming and everything's going to get warmer, and then I can have the, you know, the best time of the year, which is summertime. So we're going to head on a hike. We're going to learn about maple syrup. Um, we have a little bit of a ways, like um, maybe a third of a mile to get to the sugar bush. So uh, maybe along the way, if we see some things, we'll stop and talk about those. And if you have any questions about anything, don't hesitate to stop and ask me. Um, I've been a naturalist for over 20 years, so maybe you can stump me with a question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go this way. The Cope Environmental Center was founded back in 1992 by Jim and Helen Cope. And they were, Jim was a professor at Earlham College in biology and specifically ornithology. And Helen was a high school biology professor, or a high school biology teacher at Centerville High School. And they were very passionate about conservation and the environment. Uh, Helen was really passionate about sustainability because they recognized uh, in the 1950s that we were using our natural resources quite a bit faster than what we were able to produce them and that it just wasn't sustainable. They purchased the original 34 acres of the Cope Environmental Center uh, in 1948. And they raised their five kids in the farmhouse on the other side of the property where we're going to be. Um, and they grew, they lived off the land. So they started a Christmas tree farm to earn some extra income. They grew all of their own vegetables, uh, a lot of fruits. She had a blueberry patch that was to die for. And they raised chickens and pigs uh, for food, for meat and protein. Um, so they raised their family and they all, most of the children went to Earlham or to um, Cornell University. and. They kind of really pursued that passion, and then in 1992, they formed the, the Fran Parks Foundation, and the Cope Environmental Center is a project of the Fran Parks Foundation. Um, but it, its purpose is to promote the sustainable use of the Earth's natural resources through education, demonstration, and research. So four years ago, we decided to take their dream of sustainability to the next level, and we built that building right back there, which is our living building challenge building. Um, that is literally one of the greenest planets, one of greatest buildings on the planet. There are only 37 buildings uh, that are certified as Living Building Challenge buildings. And that means that it is, um, well, completely sustainable. Uh, we monitor our water. It's net zero water, net zero energy, and net zero waste. So all of you who ate breakfast know that we made you sort your trash. Um, and all of it today was 
compostable, um, except for the food that you might have left on your plates. So, um, very conscientious about the amount of waste that we bring out of that building. Uh, we produce all of our own electricity with the solar panels in the back, and so that building feeds back into um, how we live, work, and play in there. We produce 40% more electricity than what we need right now, so that extra electric electricity is fed back into the grid and then it uh, powers these homes that are right up Airport Road with us. Oh, that's cool. So the, the building, not only is it very sustainable, but it also is giving back to the community um, as well. So we're very proud of that. Uh, Jim and Helen, this is um, always what they were talking about was when they started the Cope Environmental Center that someday they were gonna build an education center that would change the way people think. And so we're hoping as we move through the next few years of our existence that we are able to promote their um, mission to be a, become more sustainable as a community. So when we get back, if you want a tour, I'll be happy to show you around the building. You guys ready to go for a woods? Yep. Yes. <laughs> so this area that you're standing in is kind of a transitional area and it's going through the process of what we call succession. And succession is important because we're going from bare ground to um, these are first successional species trees. Um, and then we go into more mature species of trees and then a mature forest. So when we end up in the sugar bush over there for our maple syrup, we are in a later successional stage. We are in the, um, the beech maple forest. Um, so this piece 30 years ago, you could stand and see, like you could see Lucky's house. And if you look over there, you can barely see it, uh, but not really well. Uh, all of these conifers that seeded in were blow-ins from the remaining Christmas trees from um, Jim and Helen's tree farm. So it all kind of seeded itself in and um, is working its way through. So as you're walking through here, it looks kind of like a scrubland, shrubby uh, pines kind of in the middle. And over the course of the next 20 years, we'll see all of these pine trees die out and we'll see a hardwood forest start to develop, which will be super for those of us who are really, I'm a forestry degree, so it'll be super cool for me to watch. So all these are pines here too? <laughs> yeah, they're all, um, okay. so it's really hard for me to tell what kind of pines they were yeah. because uh, Jim planted 104 different species of conifer trees here. <laughs> and then they kind of co cross pollinated and then when the wind blew their seeds over here I really don't know with certainty what kind of species all of these are. I could give you a ballpark direction but not a solid answer. <laughs> all right so when you step up through this like right up this little hill up to here you can look each direction and you'll see kind of a straight line because you know they made their fence rows out of trees and these trees were trees that would be important to them so most of these are hedge apples um, and the reason that they used hedge for fence posts is because hedge trees, because the, um, the hedge trees are very, very hardy and um, they don't rot or anything. So the thinking was if I plant a tree and then put my fence to it, it will never go away. It'll just stay there. Uh, but if we look farther down this line, and we'll see it a little further in the hike, our fence row also has a line of sugar maple trees in it. And the people, the early settlers, when they settled this area, they cleared a lot of the land for the farm ground. Um, Indiana has some of the richest farm soils in the world, and they wanted to maximize that, but when they used their um, trees for their fence line, they kept their sugar maples and planted their sugar maples in a row so they could tap those to make their maple syrup. Maple syrup um, is a very important commodity, not just for the Native Americans that we'll learn about in a minute and then the pioneers, but also in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, we did not have grocery stores. So those of you who are under the age of 25 or 30, we gotta think about that a little bit. Where did we get our food? And a lot of that um, was because uh, the the mom stayed home and they cooked the meals and they grew the the garden grew the crops and really kind of did a lot of homesteading and the maple syrup was an important piece of that high fructose corn syrup was not a thing we'll just put it that way so we're going to head right down here to the sugar camp and see what's happening down there i've been collecting problem is little chili the buckets are frozen this morning the buckets are frozen. But I've been listening to the birds. Let's all be real quiet for a minute and listen. Those birds know something. 
they know that it's about springtime, and boy, am I glad. So, while you're here, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing for a couple weeks. So, over here, I've got it set up like my Native American friends did. Because when we came here, we learned that the Native Americans found out that certain trees in this woods had a sweeter sap. The story they tell goes that a young, young Indian had been out trying to do his hunting, and he came back and he hadn't gotten anything, and he was darn frustrated. So he took his tomahawk and he went, yeah, and put his hatchet into that tree and let it hang in there. They came back and they realized that dripping off of it was some kind of liquid. So his mom put a container under there because she'd rather get some liquid right close to her cooking fire than him to go not too far over. So she took that liquid she collected, put it in her cooking vessel here. It's a mighty fine cooking vessel, isn't it? <laughs> Problem is, can't put it in the fire. So, we learned the way the natives did. They heated rocks. And boy, were they talented. Because they didn't have any metal or anything. And they put those hot rocks in that sap that they'd gotten out of that tree. And you can hear what happened. <laughs> she was cooking up some meat that day. And as it was cooking, when it's time to eat, they realized that meat was sweeter than it usually is. And they realized it was because of the liquid they collected out of that tree. And so they did some experimenting with it and they realized they could cook it down and have something really sweet. Mm -hmm. mm. So that's how the legend, the story goes, of how the settlers learned from the Native Americans the story of maple syrup. So let's go over by this fire over here. Because when we came from Europe, we brought some fine metal tools and things with us. We already knew about using minerals out of the earth. Now, normally I have three kettles going here, but we're down to the end of our maple syrup and season. So I, whew, praise the Lord, I've got it down to one. So we collect the sap, we put it in all three kettles, and we boil it down. It takes a lot of sap to make a little syrup, a lot. Like, like 40 of these buckets will make one bucket of syrup. Oh yeah, it takes a lot. So I get it boiling in all three kettles, and as it boils down, I move it over to one, and I keep filling those other two. And then I keep moving it over here as it boils down until the end kettle's mighty fine, full of good stuff. I boil it all the way down to where it's crumbly, um, like grains of sand. I bring it all the way down to that. We call it maple sugar, and that way it keeps better. I, I, it's, it's not, I don't have to deal with liquid, and then I can keep it and use it all summer. And you know, in the heat of summer, I know, it's hard to think about the heat of summer this fine morning, but think, try to think. Think into August when it's really hot and you're miserable. I dig out a little of this sugar and I put it in some really cold water. Oh, it's such a treat, such a treat, nice, such a treat. So I also use it if like my hens quit laying, but my neighbors over yonder's hens are laying. 
I'll go over with some of my sugar and I'll say, Hetty, Hetty dear, do you have any eggs? And she'll have eggs and I'll say, I've got some maple sugar and we'll trade up. I'll give her some of my maple sugar for her eggs and then we're both happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you stop at the buckets? We are going to stop at the bucket right down here. Okay. The buckets are frozen this morning. I heard. <laughs> kind of like some of your toes. <laughs> yep. I find though, think of your toes, close your eyes, think of your toes, wiggle your big toes, wiggle all your toes. And just think that way, and, and they'll, they'll feel a little better. I've been out here for two weeks. I move out here. It's not worth lugging all this sap. So I just move out here. We stay here for a couple weeks and get it all down to just sugar, and then we head back on home. So thank you for coming to visit my sugar bush. <laughs> uh, but sugar maples are one of the easier ones to identify in the woods, mostly because when you look at where the branches come out, there's a little bit of an eyebrow above the branches. The branches look like they're kind of pointing up a little bit and then there's like a, a little like parentheses or an eyebrow above it. Do you guys see that? Where? <laughs> where the, which, which, where the, branch so right? how about if we turn and look at over there, there's sugar maple trees. Yeah, this is too hard. <laughs> so above where the, the tree branch comes out, when you look at it, yeah. it has the way the, the branch collar is, where the branch comes out, if there's a little bit of a, uh, eyebrow above it, like there a little, bump. like a little bump in the. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> we can also identify them with a bucket that's the, stuck to it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is an even better plan, right? <laughs> so we come out here, um, we already know where our maple sugar trees are, our sugar maple trees are. We dig a hole, or dig, drill a hole in the tree about an inch and a half. Um, and then we stick our spile in there and then we hang our bucket on it and this bucket is two and a half gallons but it is completely full of ice today all the way full of sap actually it's uh when i just tipped it there's a little bit of water in there um it was 16 degrees when i traveled in here i don't know what the temperature is now but the sugar doesn't actually freeze so those of you who are interested you could stick your finger into the little water up here at the top and taste it and it'll be really sweet it'll taste like really sweet water so if you want to do that, come on up. Yeah. <laughs> right there, right there. Now lick your finger. Now don't put it back in. Yeah, only one. Only you don't you don't lick it and stick it back in. Right there. And now lick your finger. Does it taste sweet? <laughs> Mm. So the sap when it comes out of the tree, it is 95 to 97% water and 3 to 5% sugar, which amazingly is the, about the highest content of the trees in the forest. So um, it takes 40 gallons of maple sap Where to make that? one gallon of maple sugar or maple syrup. Uh, so it takes quite a bit of time and labor to be able to do this. So we, we put our metal buckets on the tree. We put this little hat on top of our metal buckets because we don't want the rain to fall in there. Yeah. We're already boiling off uh, quite a bit of water. Um, we need to get it down to 15% um, sugar and 85% water. So if we're boiling it that far down, we don't want it rainwater in there to, to dilute it even more. But also we want to make sure the bugs stay out and our friend the squirrels because if you were a squirrel living in this tree and somebody put your water source right here <laughs> hanging off of it you would think you won the lottery so we keep our little hats on there they don't work to get that lid off or anything they leave it alone they typically leave it alone sometimes you can see them sitting on top of it eating their their food I think if it had something other than maple sap in it they might be a little bit more no no uh, we I haven't found any buckets on the ground in the well this is my second maple syrup season here um, I haven't found any buckets on the ground here so we tapped 30 trees this year um, because we are kind of in this weird um, climate change sort of era, this has been a really good year for maple sap. 
Um, normally we are only able to make about two and a half to three gallons of maple syrup and we are already past the three and a half, four gallon mark. Um, we have 120 gallons ready to boil and then probably about another 50 to 60 gallons hanging on the trees right now. So, um, cool. got a and lot going on. It will keep, well, next week when it gets into the 50s, it's going to be, um, it's going to be pushing our limit of being able to keep it. So if any of you want to learn how to boil sap, I'd be happy to let you hang out in the sap house with me next week. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to head this way. We call this, we just, the pioneers called that the sugar camp for when they moved out into the woods. Um, to boil down their maple sap but we're going to walk through what we call the sugar bush and then end up at the sugar shack so it's all about sugar today <laughs> we love it as we're walking through i forgot to tell you one of the most important things about maple syrup and that is the reason that we have sap flow we're collecting maple sap right now is because we're at that transition between spring and winter so the key to the sap flow is when um the days are above freezing, so in the 40s, and the nights are below freezing, so uh, we like it to be below 28 degrees. And what happens inside the tree is that that triggers the tree to send the, um, during the day when it's warm, send the sap up to the top of the tree to start um, forming the release of the buds that the leaves can form. And then at night when it's freezing, the tree says, oh no, I don't want my cells to freeze because water inside cells freezing makes them burst apart. So. The, that triggers the trees to send the sap back down to the roots. So during the summer, the tree is out there and it's making all of the sap that's stored in the roots for the winter to survive. And then in the spring, that energy goes back up to form the leaves. So this time of year, for about three weeks, why that temperature fluctuates to above freezing during the day to below freezing at night is what we call maple syrup season. So the, the buckets on the trees are just gonna be here until Monday, 10 a.m. It's all coming off. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We're done. That's it. We tapped our trees on February, February 4th. Um, and so we have, I have a team of volunteers that comes in every day and collects the sap for me. I have another team that works on boiling down the sap. And this is very labor intensive and I can see it with my volunteers. They are a fantastic group of retired men and I adore each and every one of them, but they're starting to get worn out after a month. They want their... They want their retired life back. So I will give them that Monday morning at 10 a.m. when we pull the buckets in the sap. <laughs> so this maple sugar season really only lasts about um, two to four weeks, depending upon the weather, how fast that change happens. Um, historically, it's about the last two weeks of February, first two weeks of March. It fluctuates a little bit in there. Um, but this year, it's been, a really, it's been a really great sap year, sap production year. Um, the Native Americans, they collected just enough sap that they could use um, in their macaques. Like boiling down sap for them was very difficult because they did not have the benefit of uh, metal like the pioneers did. So when the pioneers came to North America, they had uh, the tin and the cast iron. So they were able to make a lot more maple syrup and they used that maple syrup to, to trade amongst themselves, but also amongst the Native Americans for the things that they needed. So then we progress along in about the 1980s, we got tired of dealing with the buckets of sap because that's pretty heavy, right? So somebody came up with this great plastic tubing deal where you could um, plastic tube your taps into a central cistern or a um, central bucket. So we just have two trees that are connected with this plastic tubing um, and goes into there. Um, but some of the bigger maple syrup productions, there's one in Centerville, um, he tapped about 120 trees. Uh, he uh, starts at the top of the hill and then all this maple tubing funnels down the hill to a central cistern that pipes right to his sap house that he built in the middle of the woods with the evaporator. So he has access to the sap pretty easily. He has access to the wood pretty easily and he makes quite a bit of maple syrup and sells it at the farmer's market and does a good job. We actually carry it in the gift shop over there at um, the Cope Center as well. So the maple tubing has really made the um, production of maple syrup quite a bit easier, quite a bit less labor intensive. Um, two and a half, those buckets hold two and a half gallons of sap, um, which is an equivalent to about 20 pounds. Each gallon is eight pounds. So when we're lugging those in and out of the woods to the sap house, 
it's quite a bit of work. Yeah. So, let's see, do you guys have any questions? Does it harm the trees at all? Like if we're taking the sap that they need to make leaves, does it have any detrimental effect? It does not if we do it uh, appropriately, sustainably. Um, we do not tap any trees that are smaller than 14 inches in uh, diameter. So anything smaller than this is not going to get tapped. So if they're 24 inches in diameter or bigger, they could have two taps. I don't think we tapped any of them with two taps this year. I think they're all single tapped trees. Um, when they're 14 inches in diameter and you tap them with one tap, that takes about 8% of their sap. Yeah, so not a very big um, loss for the tree. Um, so it doesn't really harm them at all. What we call it the belly button, which would be like the scar of the tap from last year. Um, we do not use the same tap hole. You move the tap around the tree. Um, so you kind of get a different piece of the tree. The way the, when you look at a tree and the branches, they don't move. So if you put a tap in, then it kind of affects the branches that are straight up and down from that. So you need to wait a few years before you tap in that same area again. So we just rotate it around the tree and we can count the belly buttons to see where they were tapped before to know where to tap the next year. The tree itself has an amazing ability to heal over that kind of an injury. So even the, the holes that were tapped last year, we can identify them, but the tree has completely sealed over and healed from that hole. Uh, Jim and Helen's house and their farm was right there and right here he planted well he didn't plant he just put his trail right here these two great oak trees so we have a white oak tree on the side we have a red oak tree on the side and they were always the kind of the entrance to the woods for them to go out and do their their nature hikes and um, this piece of the Cope Environmental Solar property is what we refer to as old growth and that means it was never cleared for farmland or for pasture and this wouldn't have been cleared because if you look at it the topography is really hilly and we don't like going up and down hills right do you guys feel that in your legs some today <laughs> so if we were clearing this land and we cut down trees we would have to carry those pieces of wood up the hill to the barn and that's just you know a lot of work <laughs> and even the settlers the early settlers recognize that so they would leave the very hilly areas as wooded areas um, so this, this is about a five and a half, six acre plot here that is our old growth forest. It's also our sugar bush and kind of just a really pretty place to stand when it has this kind of snow and just kind of look across and check it out. So I'll give you guys that opportunity. And then if you haven't hugged your tree today and you want to take a moment to hug a tree, the white oak and the red oak are great big and always love hugs. Zeke. <laughs> How old? So, um, Without cutting it down and counting the rings, there's really no way to be 100% accurate. But we can measure the circumference of it and then do some growth tables. But the, if it's a really great year with plenty of water and sunlight, it's going to grow faster. And then a year that has like a drought year, it's going to grow quite a bit slower. So we can look at these and they were measured at one point. Um, oak trees can live about 350 years old. These are in the 275 mark. So these are pretty old trees, certainly um, bigger specimens of their species. Uh, but still probably have another 75 to 100 years left with them. And this is where the magic happens. This is where we take tree sap and make it into, as one of the five-year-olds said last week, pancake sauce. <laughs> <laughs> so over here we have um, quite a few vessels of our sap that has been collected. And it goes into this, this contraption here we call the evaporator. And the purpose of the evaporator is clearly to get as much water off in as fast as time as possible, um, which admittedly, this one only boils off three gallons per hour. So if we're gonna make a gallon of maple syrup, it's uh, 40 gallons of sap to one gallon of syrup. So we have our 40 containers there for you to see to make our one. Three gallons an hour, if you guys did the math, it's like 12, 15 hours. <laughs> So that's why when you go to the store, it's pretty expensive to buy some maple syrup because it takes a long time, a lot of labor to get it done. So what happens is we take this um, sap from the container, it goes here into our warming tank, um, it comes out of the spigot, and then this is a three-sided or three-chambered uh, evaporator. So when you stand up here, you can check it out and see. The sap flows through, um, and then when it gets to here, it's the most like syrup. So 
I'm going to pull some off and see how close we are to have actual syrup being made. We have what we call a hydrometer here, and the hydrometer measures the density of the, the sugar in the water. So when we pull this uh, syrup off, we want it to be in between these two lines. So it's going to float in between those two lines if it's ready. If it's not ready, it will ding off the bottom. You'll hear it tank, and that's like that's a really sad sound for us to hear because oh, <laughs> we so want it to be ready. So there's a little valve over here. I'll pull some off. I can tell by looking at it that it's pretty close. It's starting to get a little foamy in here. I know that Super Dave has been working in here all morning to make sure that we could pull off syrup right when you guys come in here. So the final step then is it goes, James, can you hold up the pot behind you for Grandpa? So these are my, so my volunteers here are my son James and my dad, Super Dave. So it's a family like a pair. So, <laughs> Um, it goes through the filter and then I will take it home and I will heat it up on my stove to 180 degrees and put it in canning jars and then seal them and then um, if you stand there for 15 minutes and flip them then it will self seal in the jar and then the, that maple syrup will keep for five six years all right so in the back somebody made the comment that it's not as sticky as high fructose corn syrup which I would agree with uh, but the other thing I wanted to mention is if you've ever read the back of the bottle of your uh, fake syrup, <laughs> there's a lot of things on there that you cannot pronounce. Uh, there's salt in there, there's caramel color, there's maple flavoring, hexametaphosa, calcifate, all kinds of stuff that, that I don't know, maybe we should be eating, maybe we shouldn't. But when, when we are eating this maple syrup, it is just tree sap. There's nothing else added to it. So 100% natural, safe to eat. You know, yeah, <laughs> we certainly will. Actually, it's tasting time right about now. After hiking through the wintry wonderland of the Cope Environmental Center's forest all morning, seeing the history and the process of how maple syrup is made, we finally got to taste the freshly made maple syrup. And man, was it delicious. Way better than any maple syrup that I've ever had. You can tell by the look on my sister's face that she really likes it. But all good things must come to an end. And we started hiking back to the Cope Environmental Center's building. And I must say, the hike back was just as beautiful as the hike there. Little did I know, there was a pancake breakfast with homemade maple syrup waiting for us when we got back. And yes, the maple syrup on the pancakes took it to a whole new level of deliciousness. After eating to my heart's content, I decided it was time to visit some friends who are making maple syrup in their own backyard. And I bet if they can make maple syrup in their backyard, so can I. And I'm one maple tree away from trying it. Okay, we're the Guntel family. I'm Greg. I'm Hannah. I'm Grace. I'm Sam. I'm Emma. I'm Isaiah. I'm Pyro. <laughs> we're out here making maple syrup today. Uh, we like to make our own maple syrup just for fun. So we started about 7.30 this morning and hopefully we'll have it most of the way done before we go to bed tonight. We'll see. This is just kind of our, uh, our family time. We spend the day, day and a half, whatever it takes out here to cook it and just kind of hang out and have fun and the kids like to play in the mud. <laughs> me? And uh, I don't know, we have, a, we have a good time with it. It's something I started doing with my parents about 20 years ago. Um, make a lot of memories, a lot of fun memories doing it. I'm Hannah Guntel. Um, this is our farm out here in Sugar Valley, Ohio. We're just south of Eaton. Um, I want to show you some differences in trees and how we can uh, figure out if you've got a maple or not and the best kind of sugar maple to use. Um, this here is a sugar maple. The way we can tell, um, the first way I would say is to find, start with finding a maple tree. Um, a maple trees all have an opposite leaf arrangement. So if you look on the buds of a tree, you can see here, all the buds come out of the stem on the opposite sides. So that's all maples are gonna be an opposite leaf arrangement. Here's one, it's a mulberry, it's alternate. You can see it's back and forth. So that's, we're looking for opposite. Uh, all maples will produce sap and you can make 
uh, maple syrup from any kind of maple tree, but the sugar maple or the black maple, which is a subspecies of a sugar maple, unless you're really, really well educated and trained in it, um, most people don't see the difference. It's really just like a subspecies. Um, but you can do it with any, any maple. Like right over here, we have a silver maple. Um, you can see that the bark is very rough and almost peels off. But again, you would be looking for the opposite leaf arrangement. This here is the sugar maple. And you can see in the fissures a good telltale sign. You can see from far away, it has flat ridges. But then in the uh, fissures, it's a tan color. You can see the tan. And then another uh, neat way to tell. So I have, um, I have the silver maple stem here with the buds, and I have the sugar maple. The silver, you can see they're both in the opposite leaf arrangement because they're in the maple family. But the silver has got red buds, but the sugar maple and the black maple will look uh, very, very similar. It looks like a, like a waffle sugar cone, if you had it the other way, a brown waffle sugar cone. So that is all sugar maples will have that. It's a pretty easy and quick way to identify a sugar maple. I'm Greg Guntel, and this is my son Isaiah. Um, I've been making maple syrup now for about 20 years. Started with my parents. The season uh, for tapping trees usually changes a little bit depending on the weather. So this year I set taps um, probably the first week in January. I actually put the taps in. Um, they didn't start running until probably about the third week in January is when the sap actually started flowing. Um, so what we do, I'll get this bucket out of the way and see what's going on. It's right here, so this is a little bit of sap from the tree right here. Okay, so this year was actually a really good year. We've got about, only have about 10 taps out and we ended up with about 175 gallons of sap, um, which is a real good year. We don't normally get quite that much. But <clears throat> anyway, when I set the taps, what I do is I take a drill bit and I actually drill into the, uh, into the side of the tree there at a slight upward angle, that way the gravity will make the sap run out. And then we take a rubber mallet and we tap the just on the end of the tap here, that way it seats in the tree and doesn't pull out easily. Um, we started putting lids in, or the lids on our buckets with these hoses, because when we first started we would leave the buckets open and they would either fill with rainwater or we'd go back in the woods and find deer drinking out of our sap buckets, which is very frustrating. So that's why we started doing that that way. Um, when we set our taps, we do it on the be the southwest-ish side of the tree. Um, do that because in the wintertime, that's where most of your sun's at. Um, we, I also tend to vary where I put the tap according to other trees and objects around the trees to make sure that we're getting as much sun as possible because the heat from the sun is what makes the sap start running. So this time of year, what happens is um, your xylem and phloem inside the tree starts pulling sap up from the roots all the way up to the top and we just drill into the outer cambium layer of the tree is what we're doing and um, you don't ever drill into the heartwood because that's what will actually hurt the tree when it's on the when it's in this outer layer like that um, they'll heal back over and you can hardly see it within a year or two of where you the old tap was set all right so what we found over the years we've tried several different methods of storing the sap um, what I think works the best is just using these plastic trash cans. And uh, after we get our buckets filled, we just dump them in here and keep it. What's convenient about the trash cans is they're uh, relatively inexpensive and easy to replace when they get messed up. But they don't, uh, it freezes real easy when it gets cold, which helps keep the sap good longer. Um, if it gets too hot for too long, the sap can actually go bad on you. Um, and then the other convenient thing about having the open top like this is when it does freeze, you can bust the ice out if it's still got ice in it um, when you go to, go to start boiling it. All right, so here what we usually end up about 50 to one, so we have about 50 gallons of sap, we'll make about one gallon of syrup usually is what we end up with. Um, so uh, our pan here is uh, stainless, it's 304 stainless steel, it's a food grade. Um, no, no soldering, no lead or anything like that on it. Um, we had it actually custom made specifically for this so we don't have to worry about any of that. And then it's got three compartments. We dump the new sap in here 
and as the water boils out it gets heavier and so it also gets darker so this compartment here in the middle will be a little bit darker and serps a little heavier this is usually the darkest and the heaviest it's the closest to being done in this compartment and then when we are ready to start taking it out we can open up that spigot on the end and drain it out that way in the pots um, i like to strain as much of the uh, little barks and leaves and stuff out of this as possible while we're cooking because we also strain it later in the process as well but getting the big stuff out right now helps tremendously makes it a lot easier and that everything you see coming off the top right now is just all steam that's just all the boiling all the water out of it so and that's that's literally all we do we put the sap in and we boil the water out and you are left with the sugar that the tree made um, as far as the frame here um, this is something I made up we've used cinder blocks in the past and that that works and they do okay but you usually only get about one season out of them and the heat makes them crumble and fall apart so as long as this frame keeps working um, like it is right now and I'm happy with it we'll probably weld some sides on it and a chimney in the back to get the smoke up and away from us have a door on the front and that'll help also keep the heat more concentrated under the pan so it cooks faster um, I'm also found that the uh, using this old pallet wood works really well because it's already cured and dry it burns we get a lot of good BTUs out of it instead of having to um, use all the heat from the fire just to dry the wood out to get it to burn it helps keep the process moving um, doing it the way we do it is uh, is kind of cheap and easy it makes it pretty much so anybody can do it this way um, we've actually done it in the past I've actually even done it in canning pots over uh, you can do it over like a propane grill for example in a canning pot if you wanted to do it that way but like I said doing it this way keeps it cheap and easy for us so we can have a good time doing it um, probably not the most efficient way but we have a good time we like to just kind of hang out and uh, have some good family time and sip on coffee and hot chocolate while we're while we're making it what we have here is a maple syrup hydrometer um, we'll go ahead and dip some out it won't be enough to So really we don't have enough it's not thick enough to really be syrup yet but what happens is, is you put this in here like this Ooh, got a little full see right now see it drops all the way down so we know we don't have syrup when you see that red line right there when it floats up about right there that's when you know you've got syrup it'll thickens up and it makes this just buoyant enough to bring it up like that so this is the hot test the first line is the hot test the other the second line you see there is when it's cold you can do the same test but when it's cold, it's got to float higher. So this is how we like to finish it over the propane. We can control the heat a lot more. A um, couple, couple issues we've had in the past is we try to cook over the fire for too long and the uh, syrup gets too thin in the pan and it'll start scorching. Um, the other thing about finishing over the wood that makes it difficult is you don't really want your syrup to get over about 219 degrees. Um, as you're finishing because it'll make it crystallize later after it's in jars and sitting in the house so you want to keep it down um, but this is kind of how we do it um, makes it an easy way to control the heat and keep a keep a close eye on stuff uh, you can finish over a stove for example in the house if you just got a little bit and you're wanting to do it yourself um, basically thing you got to be careful of with that is there's a little bit of sugar that always escapes with the steam and so it makes a makes a big sticky mess or it can make a big sticky mess in the kitchen and peel paint um, we've done that before when we tried it in the house actually peeled paint off of cupboards so you got to kind of watch out for that but um, if you can get it over a grill or something like this works works really well um, we're usually not too picky we do use the hydrometer to kind of help us gauge what we're doing um, but for the most part we just take it down till it tastes the way we want it to um, it's sweet enough and the uh, right the consistency that we like there's really no not sure that there's really a right or wrong way so to speak to do it um, we like to keep the uh, thermometer handy when we're doing this especially in this stage so we can keep an eye on that on the temperature um, the way we do it is more about thickness than or consistency and how sweet it is because the the more you cook it down the sweeter it gets the darker it gets so if you the more more water it has in it it's going to be a lot lighter colored and um, not be quite as sweet 
So that's that's kind of what we gauge it by. Um, as far as the temperature goes, like I said, the 219 is what you got to be real careful of because I've done that before um, trying to get a batch finished. So I was cooking it really hard towards the end and uh, about half of it actually crystallized. It was, um, I don't know, almost looked like brown sugar, but it was, it was getting real hard like honey does almost. Yeah, um, yeah, this is actually a really easy process. You don't have to invest much money into it. Um, a lot of fun. Uh, pretty much anybody can do it. If you just have a maple tree, one or two is enough. Um, you know, once, usually through February, you can get about five gallons a day off of a tree. Um, so, you know, just go buy yourself a cheap plastic trash can, wash it out real good, and that's what we store ours in. Um, works real good till you're ready to boil, but um, yeah, when you just boil it down, like I said, I recommend trying to do it over a propane grill or something if you're going to do it cheap and easy the first time around. Um, but that's really all you need is the, the sap and something to boil it. Boil the water off and you're left with the sugar. It's really, really that simple. You can make it as in-depth and technical as you want or you can keep it super simple. We, we tend to gravitate towards the super simple side and just, like I said, when it gets uh, the kind of the thickness or consistency that we like and the sweetness, we we call it good and have our French toast and pancakes. I guess we started making maple syrup. I was pretty young, about 12 or 13 maybe ish, something like that. And um, when we started, it was a pretty uh, pretty crude process. We actually, my parents have about 40 acres of woods. Um, it's about half a mile or so from the house. And we'd go back there and we'd tap our maple trees back there. And because we had trouble moving the sap, we actually started out by cooking in the woods which was a lot of fun get to go hang out in the woods, you know, all day, a couple days while we're cooking. Um, a lot of the challenges we found with cooking back in the woods though, uh, cause it was so far moving stuff back there, we ended up having to take uh, trucks and tractors and stuff back into the woods, which it's real sloppy this time of year. Um, that, that always made, uh, made for a fun time. That's how I got to learn to drive, was driving stuff back and forth. Um, in the mud, got a lot of got a lot of vehicles stuck. Burnt transmission out of a couple vehicles. Doing that is, I guess, is handy back there because the wood's always available when you're back in the woods. That part was good, but um, doing that and then being back there in the cold, it's not always as warm as it is right now. Um, we made maple syrup a lot when it's super cold, and uh, I know uh, remember my dad in particular a couple times his coat catching on fire, standing next to it, trying to stay warm when it was real cold. His coat would catch on fire and have to put him out. Uh, just different stuff like that and I know when we used to do it then moving the buckets we'd carry it um, we'd actually carry the buckets across the woods which always makes for a fun adventure in the morning trying to get that done get buckets dumped so um, kind of started that way and then eventually we started kind of moving the pan up closer to the house and transporting the sap up and doing it that way um, which kind of what we're doing now um, then when Hannah and I got married uh, we started doing it more again, um, just the two of us. Yeah, our first year of marriage, we made it. That well, was my first first experience with it. I was doing it actually. We started in the woods and then finished up at his folks' house. The finished boiling and then we, um, the finished where we had to um, keep it controlled. We did it on the stove at our house, and that's where I learned not to do that because we had just painted our kitchen and our cabinets and I was there he had been at work so I was just finishing I didn't I really didn't know what to expect I'm just boiling away and checking it with the hydrometer and making sure that it's getting thick like it's supposed to and the next thing I look up and I see maple syrup running down my walls of my kitchen so that that wasn't fun so we knew we had to change something with that because it, it made a big mess it's just everything was just covered in sugar and and I overboiled it I didn't know I wasn't supposed to let it boil get above was it 219 I just I didn't know yet so I crystallized a lot of syrup that year so made mis my mistakes but I learned and you know we're getting better at it so mostly just for us I guess it's just making a lot of making memories just kind of hanging out and relaxing and having a good time with it. We don't get in too big of a hurry with much of anything when we're making maple syrup. Pancakes with syrup. Alright. Can you pour her? What's your favorite part about it? Mine. 
<laughs> the mud. <laughs> we have lots of that here, don't we? Yeah. yeah. When it rains a lot. What's yours, Gracie? When, when, my favorite part um, about mom this comes is probably getting rain. to spend time with my family. Yeah. Mom comes yeah. from rain. My favorite part is when Gracie falls off the zip line into the mud. Yeah. <laughs> We'll edit that out yeah. and we'll ask him that one again. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny.